Florence, can you tell us what was the genesis of this book? What led you to writing this book? As an environmental journalist, I had heard uh, research uh, looking into toxic chemicals in breast milk. And at the time, I was nursing my second child. So I decided to tell the story um, using my own body. And I, I thought I would just test my own breast milk and find out what was in there. And so I, I hooked up with a study um, here in Texas. And uh, we sent the breast milk to a lab in Germany. And I found out that I had uh, flame retardants in my breast milk and um, some residual uh, pesticides and a jet fuel ingredient. And that really launched me down this path of writing the book. I wanted to find out how else breasts are changing in modern life uh, and what it means for our health. Let's just deal with that issue for one second. All these things that you found, these chemicals that you found in your own body that you're now giving to your baby. I mean, as a journalist, as a mother, had you not gone down the road of, of writing a book, you would have never have stumbled on that, likely. That's right. That's right. It's something that a lot of people don't know. Uh, certainly, people don't realize that we have hundreds and hundreds of chemicals coursing through our bloodstreams. And it turns out that our breasts are um, sort of brilliant at converting uh, some of these substances from our environment into breast, uh, into breast milk. Um, of course, that's what they were designed to do. And uh, unfortunately, we, we were not evolved to really metabolize these industrial chemicals um, or to handle them. And so we're still learning about the health effects. So what did that cause you to do, if anything, in terms of, of your own self, your children, et cetera, when you first came across this finding? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I did a lot of research to try to find out uh, if continuing breastfeeding was a good idea. And the consensus uh, really was that breast milk uh, is still such a miraculous, fantastic substance for our babies uh, that the benefits still outweigh the risks. So I continued breastfeeding, and I don't have any regrets that I did. What else did you find out, Florence, in the, in the, um, the process of doing research for your book? Well, I found out that breasts are really, really sensitive organs. And they're in a const constant conversation with the world around us. Uh, and that's, that's the way they evolve. They're supposed to be that way. You know, they're filled with estrogen and progesterone receptors. Uh, that's how our breasts know when to start developing in puberty. It's how our breasts know uh, when to continue growing the mammary gland in the last semester or last, sorry, in the last trimester of pregnancy. Um, and, and so we know that modern life is really affecting breasts because breasts are so changeable. And so we know that breasts are arriving earlier in younger and younger girls. And we know that breasts are actually getting bigger in modern life. Uh, and that's really largely a result of our diets because our bodies are just bigger everywhere. Um, and, and of course, now we know that there are these substances in our breast milk that aren't really supposed to be there. So if I'm a parent um, of a daughter, which I happen to be, what should I take away from your book? Well, one of the things I learned is that uh, breast tissue, as it's developing, is very sensitive during adolescence. Uh, and that appears to be actually the most sensitive time for breasts to be exposed to carcinogens. And we know this from studying radiation victims. Um, we know it from uh, studying girls who were exposed to certain pesticides uh, and are now at a higher risk of breast cancer. So I think as parents, we really... Um, have this kind of responsibility to try to protect our girls during this really sensitive time um, during puberty and before puberty. And so, so for me, I, I really try to um, limit my daughter's exposure, if I can, to certain endocrine-disrupting chemicals, um, and those are things like phthalates, which are in personal care products that bind scent. So I try to buy um, fragrant-free personal care products. I, I try not to have a lot of smelly um, you know, deodorizers um, and, and perfume products in the house. I also try, um, I try to avoid, uh, to the extent possible, it's really hard, I try to avoid plastics. So, for example, I pack my daughter's lunch in um, cloth or in glass. Um, but, of course, it's, it's really hard. <laughs> it's really hard to avoid buying food that comes wrapped in plastic. So, I, you know, I, I don't go crazy trying to do it. But, but if it's possible to limit it, I, I do try it. And are all these changes the direct result of the research that you uncovered in the process of writing your book? Yes, they 
are. I, I learned so much about how chemicals can alter human hormone systems. Uh, and it's, it's creepy to know that so many chemicals in our environment um, can actually affect our cells and can affect cellular change um, and affect our, things like our thyroid, uh, which, which governs uh, everything from our metabolism um, to, to um, uh, all sorts of other biological processes in the body, such as neurodevelopment even in our brains. Uh, and so, so learning this, um, one of the things I have realized is that we need to do more testing of chemicals. And many, many manufactured products in our world are never tested for human health effects. Um, so, so I think it's, it's one good place for parents to sort of direct their energies because it's so hard to actually filter our own households and our own bodies. Um, one thing we can do is, is try to demand more chemicals testing. Well, and it also sounds that we almost have to become sort of, you know, many expert scientists as parents, right? Well, that's one thing that I find um, sort of impossible. You know, we can't all be expected to add this to our very busy and full plates <laughs> that we already have. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think it's important to find out, um, you know, what other groups are doing, women's health groups, children's health and environmental groups. Um, they have some great websites. There's the Environmental Working Group, for example, um, has some websites of products to avoid and chemicals to avoid where possible. Uh, and, and also there are some lobbying efforts, uh, letter writing campaigns, uh, you know, anything we can do to uh, improve legislation for chemicals testing uh, helps us all. Now, you happen to be the mother of an eight-year-old girl, as yeah. am I. How do you go about trying to explain even some of these concepts to a, a little eight-year-old girl? I think it's very hard, and I don't want her to grow up with a lot of um, fear, and I don't want to be, um, you know, a big uh, policeman in the family either. So, I, I, you know, I think it's important to sort of pick and choose our battles. Uh, if she wants to paint her toenails once in a while, I let her do it. Um, so I, I don't believe in being really rigid about things that we deny, experiences that we deny our children. Um, but I do think it's important to discuss discuss with our children um, that, that some things in our environment, um, you know, may not be safe for us. And, and, and um, we need to just be prudent where we can and try to limit some exposures. But, it, but it, these are difficult conversations to have. And, and it's not really my personality to want to have them a lot. No, and you're not alone. Certainly there are other parents uh, in that boat. Um, apart from the whole health piece, which is obviously just a massive part of, of what's involved in your book and what you've written about, what else did you discover that surprised you about the topic of, of female breasts? One thing that surprised me is how unique they are. Uh, you know, we think that all mammals have mammary glands, and of course that's true, but... but Mammals don't have mammary glands that look like ours. Our breasts are really unique in the animal kingdom, and, and part of that is because they develop in puberty, and they are sort of permanently enlarged um, in, in these sort of pretty packages, and then we have our breasts our entire adult lives, which is really interesting because other, other primates, for example, um, their breasts or their mammary glands really recede after breastfeeding. So it really depends on their lactational status, and we have them all the time. So, I, you know, depending on your, on your perspective, we're, we're, we're pretty lucky. <laughs> <laughs> what other advice um, would you have for parents on the whole subject of, of breasts and how to deal with it in, you know, addressing the issue with their daughters as they're developing or even as they're teens? Because, let's face it, many young girls are very self-conscious. They are, and uh, you know, one thing I write about in the book is the topic of early puberty uh, and how breasts are showing up in younger and younger girls. Um, and, and this is something that parents are concerned about because we know that early puberty is a risk factor for breast cancer later on. Uh, we also know that girls who develop earlier are at greater risk for depression and substance abuse uh, and sexual abuse. So um, as, as parents, uh, it's very important to encourage our daughters to be athletic and to have healthy diets um, because there is some relationship between uh, body fat and the timing of puberty. Uh, and, and, you know, these sorts of habits are, are good for them for a lot of reasons, not just for breast development. Um, so, so as parents, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's partly our responsibility to help instill these healthy habits for living. Absolutely. 
Anything else that you uncovered, Florence, that you say after you wrote this book, which you said, you know, took you on and off about five years, that you came away with and said, wow, you know what, that has had a major impact on me. I think it was astonishing for me to learn just how dynamic breasts are, um, that they're these incredibly um, changeable and sort of mutable organs that we have in the body. Uh, you know, they don't even finish growing until our adulthood, really until the last trimester of pregnancy. So um, from the period that from puberty until that first pregnancy, which for some women is decades long, that interval, um, our breasts are, are not yet fully grown up. And because of that, our breast cells may remain immature. Uh, and that may be one of the reasons why breasts are so uh, sensitive to carcinogens. Um, the breast cells haven't differentiated yet. And so there's this period of vulnerability that lasts from puberty through adulthood. Uh, and so I think during that time, too, it's just um, it's important to try to take care of ourselves and um, not be exposed to unnecessary radiation, um, try to um, eat a healthy diet, uh, not be overweight. Um, there is also a relationship between alcohol and breast cancer. But these are things that uh, really uh, add up to pretty small risks, too. So there's a lot we still need to learn about breast cancer and a lot we need to do to try to learn to prevent it. What's been the feedback and the response to the book, Florence? Oh, the feedback's been really positive. It turns out that everyone is interested in breasts. <laughs> <laughs> you picked a great subject matter. <laughs> People love to talk about breasts. Yeah. Of course, they love to look at them. I don't have very many pictures in the book, so I'm sorry that that disappoints some of my male readers. <laughs> <laughs> but let me ask you this, and I don't, you know, I don't know uh, if you had a chance to, to look at this in the course of your research, but is there a dramatic difference in the way breasts are viewed in North America as opposed to other parts of the world? That's a great question. I, I think there is. I think uh, in North America, breasts are um, just highly, highly sexualized, more so than in many other parts of the world. And I think that's partly um, the influence of Hollywood. Um, I think it's partly the influence of sort of our burlesque culture that developed in the middle of the last century. Um, I think uh, certainly our plastic surgery field uh, is, is you know, still the strongest in the world, and we are now exporting boob jobs all over the world. Uh, there, there are now uh, many parts of the world um, that, that didn't used to place a lot of emphasis on breasts and, and now are doing more so, and, and I think it's partly because of the culture that, that we've exported elsewhere. What is one theme or one message that you'd like readers to leave with once they read your book? I would love readers to come away with an understanding of how our breasts are intimately connected to the world around us. And uh, breasts are uniquely sensitive this way, but they're also really a metaphor for our health overall. Because uh, chemicals and toxins that affect our breast tissue are also getting into other parts of our bodies. Um, they're also in our other organs. And I think it's, um, you know, it's fun to talk about breasts. It's more fun to write a book about breasts than to write a book about the liver, <laughs> for example. But, but I think that we can really learn from breasts um, about human health in general. Florence, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Leanne.